So this is an incredibly important group. As you know, we've already had one session, uh, which was two years ago. And I'm really uh, feel wonderfully proud when I see those first century group members and their activities today. This is the second session. I think it'll be the last session of the new century group. We may have other sorts of groups in the future, but I think this will be the, this will be the last session. This brings the total, this, this session will bring the total number of young men and young women in the new century group to 250 or thereabouts. And I think that's a horrible ringing sound. I think that is the most incredible nucleus for the future of Costa Nufu of the UK, don't you? So, of course, uh, we called it the, new the 21st century group, the new, cent the new century group, um, because uh, in the 21st century, you will, as young people now, will be gradually taking over leadership of Costa Rica in this country. So by establishing the new century group, I hope that we can guarantee that leadership in the future. Of course there will be many other leaders, but you, all of you, during the course of these many sessions, uh, should become uh, friends with each other uh, and establish relationships uh, which will never ever be broken up. In this way, you can move into the future trusting each other and really being friends with each other and determine between you all through supporting and encouraging each other to build the great castle of Coast Rufa in this country in the years to come. So right at the end of this session, uh, we'll have uh, a sort of final ceremony or general meeting and to that session, uh, the, the young men and young women's leaders who were on the first New Century Group session will join you. And I sincerely hope that we can make that the most incredible, great day. Uh, and I hope we can end it with uh, some sort of a meal together or something or other and really imprint that day on our minds forever. And of course, it's not by chance that you're all here together today. This is always difficult to understand. And somehow or other, you made the causes to be here today. Not just in this lifetime, but in previous lifetimes. So uh, this is another reason why to renew your relationship with each other for Kosen Rufa is, of course, very important. You're reviving something which has happened before. And this is what this, or the reason why I chose this particular guidance as an extra in a way, it's an extra lecture. But when I read it, this guidance of President Decatur's about Bodhisattvas of the Earth, I really felt it would put everyone on the right, sort of orientate them right at the beginning of this course um, and make one feel the significance of it very deeply. There's an awful lot of it. I'm not sure that we're going to get through it all. But I want you to look upon it not as a lecture, this. It's really an informal uh, talk by me to give you what I feel and understand and believe about this amazing guidance. That's the purpose of it. And uh, it's going to be rather one way, this first session. In the other sessions, uh, it'll be two way because we'll always have time for questions and discussion. But today is going to be one way, I'm afraid. Also, the time today, because of other activities later on, uh, has to be a bit shorter by about half an hour. So we've got to get a lot done in that time. Um, so if you now turn to your guidance, we'll begin. Have you all got it? No one hasn't got it. So we'll take it bit by bit. Robert will read and then I'll comment. And I hope that way that we can really take 
this guidance deep into our lives. Okay, everybody. Right, Robert, on we go. Practice is the essence of the Daishonin's Buddhism. The following guidance, which concerns correct attitude to faith, was given to a meeting of chapter leaders in Tokyo on September the 20th, 1986. Life passes quickly as to the seasons of the year. No sooner are we enjoying the fragrant cherry blossoms of springtime than we find ourselves in the sweltering heat of summer which beckons us adoringly toward the sea. And just when we are bearing up to the heat, we find that we have entered autumn with the soothing cries of bell ring crickets, whereupon the season of yellow and crimson leaves begins. These past few years, unfortunately, the harvest moon has been obscured by clouds impossible to see. However, as we are seated before the Gohonzon reciting the sutra and chanting Daimoku, a brilliant sun rises in the microcosm within our hearts, and an immaculate harvest moon shines at all times. This occurs because our life fuses with the Gohonzon, which is endowed with the functions of the sun and the moon deities. Buddhism thus expounds the mysterious fusion of life and the universe. Thank you. This occurs because our life fuses with the Gohonzon, which is endowed with the functions of the sun and the moon deities. Buddhism thus expounds the mysterious fusion of life and the universe. When Sensei mentions here the sun and the moon, of course he's referring to the forces of the universe or the Shoten Zenjin, which actually take part in Gongyo with us. Uh, I often quote Mr. Toda in this respect because he expressed his incredible feeling of wonder and joy that whenever he sat down in front of the Gohonzon to do Gongyo, started to recite the first prayer in the morning, all the Shoten Zenjin came and lined up on either side of him, bowing as he bowed and reciting the sutra with him. This incredible sort of image which Mr. Toda had, it's an image, meaning that through that first prayer of Gongyo, you bring together with you all the forces of the universe including, of course, the sun and the moon and the stars. And they are, in that sense, doing gongyo with you. You feed the power of your gongyo and the daimoku with which you concluded to those Shoten Zenji. And as a result of that, they act and react positively in terms of your life and your environment, too. The sensei talks here about the seasons. We are susceptible to the seasons. Sometimes people say, oh, I feel very funny today. The reason may be not that that person is heading for flu, but because of the season, because of the, because of the weather, in other words, on that particular day. So it would be good, if you wish to follow that up a little more, to read a Gosho call on omens, which is in volume four, and it's on particular passage is on page 145 and 146. We haven't got time today to talk about it. It's a lecture in itself. But suffice it to say that uh, in that particular that passage of the Gosha, Nichiren Daishonin describes or analyzes the connection between parts of our body and life, physically and spiritually, and uh, the elements themselves. So it's very fascinating, Gosha. Um, just to give you, uh, make your mouth water a bit. Uh, he is talking in the Gosha about omens in terms of the earth tremors which occurred when Shakyamuni Buddha was going to teach the Lotus Sutra. But you can also apply it, of course, to winds, rain, storms, anything uh, in terms of the elements. So the east wind, for example, is connected to the color green. And the color green connects with the liver. So some people, which includes me, feel an east wind, even though they may be sitting in a cozy room in front of a fire, they know an east wind is blowing. I'm one of those sort of people, particularly susceptible to east winds. I know when an east wind is blowing, even as I say, I'm sitting in a warm house because it has an effect on my life. And I've, over the years, I've got used to recognizing that effect. It's really extraordinary. But the, I am susceptible to that. And what is more, it makes me always feel disturbed. 
and a bit jumpy and irritable. And uh, uh, I know it now only too well. So the east wind, this is also connected through the, to the eyes. So the color green, the eyes and the liver, all affected by, uh, for example, an east wind. Uh, the west wind is connected to the nose. You can feel very heavy and clogged up if there's a west wind blowing sometimes. Not all of you, because all of you, each of you is different. Each of you may have a susceptibility to a particular direction. But the west wind certainly uh, can make people feel very heavy because it's connected to the nose and to the lungs, and to the color white. The north winds uh, are connected to the ears. Sometimes when there's a north or a northeast blowing, some people suffer from headaches and a feeling of sickness, feeling they want to vomit. My wife is one of those. Uh, northeast winds often bring snow and she's like a barometer it's really so if the snow's coming she always feels unwell it's a really strange thing so of course once one becomes aware of this either through long experience of life or through one's mind being awakened through reading the ghost show you I'm sure begin, begin to reflect sometimes on yourself and think wow yes maybe that is the, you know, the elements and not something wrong with me personally the south wind is connected with the tongue and uh, south winds are often especially in some parts of the world very hot winds very dry they can make you feel you're losing your appetite and so on. Of course, each has a positive side too. Each direction of the compass doesn't only bring negative feelings, such as I've been describing, but are also positive ones, which are, again, inevitably directly related, of course, to those various parts of the body. So it was Dr. Yamazaki said once, I really feel that so far as the UK is concerned, the most alert, creative sensitivity in the lives of people of the UK as a whole is the ears. People in this country like, on the whole, singing, music, drama, all to do with the ears, isn't it? Of course, there's some aspect of the eyes as well in a musical show like Alice, but the ears are particularly sensitive. The ears, as I said, connect with the north. We are rather a northern island, aren't we? Strangely enough, however, that doesn't apply, for example, to France, where Dr. Yamazaki has lived now for, I think, something like 25 years. In France, they're more sensitive to the nose and the tongue. They're a great nation in terms of the wonderful food they produce. And of course, they are basically a Latin race. They came from the south. And the tongue, as you know, according to the Gosho, is connected with the south. So I'm quite sure if one looked around the world and got to know each country, you would find the relationship of the people of that country to the senses. And the senses, in turn, have a relationship to direction or the compass direction. So it sounds amazing, but actually, when you think about it, this is the explanation, isn't it, of the workings of the principle called Esho Funi. So although I've been talking today about how the elements can affect you, but equally, of course, you can as easily affect the elements. So in this same Gosha, Nichiren Daishonin talks about the fact that when the people's lives are agitated, 
then the elements respond accordingly. This, of course, is the whole or part of the great message, isn't it, of the Risho Ankokuron. The agitation in the hearts of the people brings about strange calamities and disasters. Fear, in other words. Fear, if it grows widespread, brings those calamities and disasters. Lack of life force through that fear. Life force feeds the elements, feeds everything in our environment. If we have no life force and we're negative, then uh, the whole environment responds in a negative way. So amazing. But certainly we can see it happening. And of course in the Risho Ankhokoron, in great detail, Nitra and Lajonin analyzes that relationship with what are known as the three calamities and seven disasters. So, as you know, probably I've just written, a, a, I think, it, was it in the same one? No, in the next month after this, I wrote a, um, an editorial about AIDS. AIDS is one of the three calamities and seven disasters. Pestilence, if you look it up in the dictionary, means an, an epidemic of fatal illness. And pestilence is one of those three calamities and seven disasters. So, again, it is the life of the people which affects greatly the workings of the elements on their lives. So the elements can affect us, but we also have a profound effect on them. And this is why, another, another reason why Gongyo is so incredibly important. Through Gongyo, through doing a fantastic morning Gongyo, what I call a real fighting Gongyo, where you determine to defeat all the negative forces at work in your life, and to make that take you through the rest of the day, through that attitude, you, of course, are also the life force that you develop through that. You are feeding to everything in your environment, including all the Shotin Zenjin and the elements. Hmm? So amazing, isn't it? Yet one cannot deny it. Because we can get uh, such amazing actual proof. The Risho Ankokoron is living today. It was written specifically in terms of the disasters and calamities in Japan in the 13th century. But those calamities and disasters occurring exactly in the same way in the world as a whole today. So pestilence, AIDS, is not one category of people's fault. It's everybody's fault. That's the point. It's the whole world's fault every human being's fault, just the same as war is every human being's fault. Just the same as the nuclear war threat is every human being's fault. We have brought this upon ourselves. This, of course, is, isn't it, the very heart of the great message of Buddhism, really, that we are connected with all things, and therefore we must take entire responsibility for our own lives isn't it? It's no good blaming or complaining on Mr. Toda's, uh, the anniversary of his death on the 2nd of April, we had a gongyo as usual at Richmond, and we read one of his guidances. It's called Standing on Your Own Feet. And the whole of that guidance in very earthy terms, very simple and understandable terms, was concerning standing on our own feet. In other words, we must take the responsibility for whatever situation we find ourselves in, not just only as an individual, but also collectively as a people, race, or nation. Okay. Should we move on? All right. Okay, Robert. It gives me great joy to know that all of you are struggling ahead, day and night, for the sake of Kosen Rufu. The Gosho and Lotus Sutra clearly explain the extent to which you are devoting yourselves to Kosen Rufu are admired and protected by Nichiren Daishonin. Confidence in this is itself faith. The Ujutsu 15th chapter of the Lotus Sutra contains a passage which states, Day and night ever persevering in order to seek the Buddha way. Simply interpreted, this passage from the Ujutsu chapter means that Bodhisattvas of the earth day and night persevere in the practice of faith 
in order to seek the way of the Buddha and realize enlightenment. The Daishonin interprets this passage on a deeper level. According to his interpretation in the Yongi Kuden, the phrase, in order to seek the Buddha way, is to be read from the outset, seeking the Buddha way. Referring to the entire quotation, the Daishonin states, the attainment of the Buddha way takes millions of kalpas, but when you exert tremendous effort, efforts towards this goal with unwavering faith in the Gohonzon, the inherent three properties of the Buddha are manifested in an instant. Chanting and propagating faith in nam myoho renge kyo requires continuous and concentrated efforts. Here the Daishonin reveals the teaching that, in view of the principle of simultaneity of cause and effect, a person who day and night continuously exerts himself in the Buddha way has already attained Buddhahood and is living a life of unsurpassed happiness. Thank you. A person who day and night continuously exerts himself in the Buddha way has already attained Buddhahood and is living a life of unsurpassed happiness. How about that? You may not feel it at this moment, but Nishan Daishonin said, when you chant nam myoho renge you are in Buddhahood. When you do shakabuku, you are in Buddhahood. When you are really deeply and sincerely studying the Gosho, you are in Buddhahood. This is the reality. So the problem is, isn't it, our minds. It's just our minds that cannot grasp this. But, Nichiren Daishonin says, through continuous and concentrated efforts, in the end one will through continuous, concentrated efforts of doing the three practices, basically. Daimoku and Gongyo, Shakabuku, introducing others to Buddhism and study. Inevitably, in the end, your life and my life will expand and open until we can really see that Buddhahood has become the main uh, state of our lives. But it's nothing else but opening our minds up to that reality. In reality, he's saying here in this Gosho passage, you are already living a life in the state of Buddhahood. But you, with your mind, won't believe it. Therefore, you doubt. You know the way you should go, but something else in your life is saying, should I, shouldn't I, shouldn't I, shouldn't I? You know, is that feeling really right? Oh, yes, I know I felt that, but... <laughs> Isn't it? It's our, lo our minds that are the problem. And the whole process of the human revolution is opening our minds to the fact that it's really true that Buddhahood exists in us. That's what the human revolution is. Hmm? Deep in one's life, one is in Buddhahood. I think that you can begin perhaps to grasp this in the best way, in that if you really do a gongyo with a great fighting spirit, and you determine to chant at the end of that gongyo until you feel joy coming up in your life, then you will begin to really appreciate every day that there is this amazing state of life in you. And this is a great help. And if you try it, you definitely can. The problem is that we end up our Dharmaku like we began it, full of our problems. <laughs> Isn't it? How on earth can we expect to feel happy if right up to the last single minute we're full of our problems? We get up from the gongs in the same state <laughs> as we sat down in front of it. So, the point is to leave time towards the end of one's daimoku. Of course it's right to chant about one's problems. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that, it's only human to do so. But at least reserve a little time at the end, as I often put it, to give Nichiren Daishonin a chance to speak. <laughs> Instead of repeating your problems over and over and over and over and over. And you definitely will find this extraordinary joy coming up from the depths of your life. If you clear your mind with the attitude, I've given all my problems, now I want to just you know, listen to the sound and love your energy. And you feel this extraordinary joy well enough. So I discovered this just by 
eavesdropping on President Akia, President Silver Gakai, giving guidance to someone very quickly uh, in Los Angeles. And I just caught him saying this. And I asked the interpreter, he was talking to a Japanese person, and they said, he's saying, you know, you should chant until you feel joy rising up in your life. So I was immediately anxious to try this. I'd never thought of doing it. Probably I too was, you know, ending my time off of every day with my problems. And I tried it, and it's just amazing how it happened. Sometimes, even to this day, I forget about it. If I'm particularly worried about something that's going on in NSUK or whatever, sometimes I forget about it. But so I think always it's fairly well established now in my life, so I remember the next day instead. But please try it. Please try it. And you'll feel great then. You're opening your life, aren't you, to the gods by that very action of the attitude. Okay, I've given my problems. Now I just want to open my life and see Nam Yorikyo on the gods and then listen to it with my ear. The sound of Nam Yorikyo. All right? Okay, Robert? Nam Yorikyo kyo is continuous and concentrated <laughs> efforts. All of you devote yourself to chanting Daimoku and carry out the practice of Shakabuku and propagation activities with your sights set on the goal of Kosen Rufu exactly as the Daishonin teaches. This itself constitutes continuous and concentrated efforts. Have confidence that we who are practicing exactly as described in this passage of the Ongi Kuden are living our lives in the greatest possible way. Next, I would like to explain the Ujutsu springing out of the earth springing up out of the earth chapter which is the 15th chapter of the Lotus Sutra immediately preceding the Juryo chapter it is the opening chapter of the essential teaching of the Lotus Sutra which comprises the last 14 of the Sutra's 28 chapters moreover the latter half of the Ujutsu chapter the Juryo chapter and the former half of the Funbetsu Kudoku 17th chapter together are referred to as the one chapter and two halves Ippon Nihan expounded here is the core of the essential teaching the key to all of the teachings of Buddhism. The one chapter and two halves was, was originally expounded by Tian Tai, but the Daishonin, Daishonin interprets it in a new light. He identifies it as the essential teaching for the latter day of the law, or the Juryo chapter as viewed from his enlightenment. That is, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, the original cause for enlightenment embodied as the Gohonzon of the three great secret laws. So the first 14 chapters of the Lotus Sutra, as I'm sure you all know already, is known as the theoretical teachings. And the last 14 chapters out of the 28 chapters of the Lotus Sutra are the essential teaching. And the Jurya chapter is the heart or essence of that teaching. And this is why, of course, we recite it every day in Gongyo. And anyway, so far as I'm concerned, I find the breakthrough if I'm, in, in, in terms of the negative aspect of one's life, definitely occurs towards the end of that determination or often struggle even to recite the whole of the Juryo chapter that you read from your Gongyo books as you know, determinedly and correctly and rhythmically as possible. It's a point of breakthrough that. We are lifting ourselves or severing our earthly attachments, our mundane earthly attachments and desires through reciting that chapter. This is in, the, in practical terms, in challenging it and doing it. And of course, the better we do it, the greater the effect. Do that, we are cutting. You, I think you probably heard that once Dr. Yamazaki called it like soaring away in a hot air balloon. If you get into the basket, I thank goodness I've never done it, but if you get into, <laughs> if you get into the basket of the balloon, it's all attached, isn't it, to the ground with cables and ropes and goodness knows what, and eventually they're all cut or, or undone and you soar away. And I really feel this is what happens in the Juryo chapter. If you really give your life to it and to its determined way that you challenge the negative state of your life in reciting it, you begin to lift off 
All those attachments, of course, cause illusions. Hmm? We are deluded, aren't we, by our problems. We think they're insurmountable. We think we can never establish a good relationship with our fathers or mothers, or we think it's impossible. But you're cutting all that, hmm? just like the ropes of that hot air balloon in reciting the Jurya chapter. This is the great benefit of it. And after that, more and more, I mean, it certainly in my experience, the third prayer, you really feel somehow lifted up out of all that clutter and muck. And you can begin to think about Nichiren Daishonin and Nikko Shonin and Nichimoka Shonin and all the high priests in a much clearer way. And then you come to the fourth prayer where you make your determination to give something to Kosen Roof in terms of your human revolution and activities of Kosen Roof. So definitely, it's a process of lifting oneself out of the slush and muck and filth of one's daily problems. One's karma, isn't it? And this happens during the recital of that chapter. So it's a very, very important matter. Of course, uh, uh, in terms of uh, Buddhism, uh, in a less perhaps practical sense, or in a symbolic sense, you're reciting the Jurya chapter in praise, ultimately, of Namyo Harengakyo of the Three Great Secret Laws. That is to say, Namyo Harengakyo of the Three Great Secret Laws came out of the essence or heart of that Jurya chapter. It was Nichiren Daishonin's enlightenment that drew it out from that. Hmm? So you recite the Jurya chapter in, to recognize the flow of Buddhism, its orthodox flow from Shakyamuni to Nichiren Daishonin's declaration of Namyo Rengekyo and his inscription of the Gohonzon. But also, he said himself that the Gohonzon is an exact image of the ceremony in the air, the ceremony of the treasure tower, exactly as the print matches the woodblock, he said. So, you are recognizing the flow of Buddhism, you are praising it, and you are leading of course, to the fundamental practice, the most important practice, which is chanting Namya Marengakyo to the gods. So there is also that aspect, as well as its value to you, in the down-to-earth terms, reciting it. Do you follow everybody? So in the end, you recite the Jurio chapter in praise of Nam Myoho Rengekyo, the Three Great Secret Laws, which Nichiren Daishonin, as the true Buddha, took out of it and gave it to us so that we could also attain enlightenment. Shakyamuni, as you know, never said how we could attain enlightenment. And this was the task of the original true Buddha, Nichiren Daishonin. All right. Okay, you're all right. Let me explain the outline of the Ujutsu chapter from the Hoshi chapter on. Shakyamuni repeatedly exhorts those gathered to propagate his teachings after he has entered Nirvana. How Buddhism will be spread in the time after his passing is a matter of great importance. The second Soka Gakkai president, Jose Toda, who laid the foundation of Kosen Rufu in post-war Japan, was deeply concerned about how Kosen Rufu would unfold after his death. I have similar feelings as well. Though one's own death is simple enough, if one is satisfied with what, one, what he has achieved in his life, Kosen Rufu is a great undertaking to be carried on throughout the eternal future. Even in families, things do not end with one's own generation. Each of us desires the lasting prosperity of his line. Thus, even in the dimension of a household or a family, the question of what will happen after one's death is no simple matter. How much greater is the problem, then, with respect to the propagation of the law? I believe that herein, lies the profound significance of Shakyamuni's repeated exhortations and appeals to his followers to spread the teachings of Buddhism after his death. I agree wholeheartedly with that. That's the whole purpose of the new century group, you could say. That there, that there is a core, a nucleus of leaders who no matter what the obstacle or difficulty continue to spread the 
law in America throughout this country. So this is very important to me at my age. I don't know when I'm going to die. I think I've got a good time to go yet, says he. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> but I don't want to be caught short. I was going to say with the trousers down. <laughs> I don't want to be caught out, right? Therefore, we must begin now to make sure of the future. And this is what the New Century Group, as I say, is for. So, on we go, Robert. In response to Shakyamuni's appeals in the Kanji chapter, 80 myriads of millions of Nayutas of Bodhisattvas vow to spread the Buddha's teachings throughout the worlds in the ten directions and ask for his protection. And at the beginning of the Ujutsu chapter, great Bodhisattvas from other worlds, numbering as many as the sands of eight Ganges rivers, vow to spread the teachings of Buddhism in this Saha world after the Buddha's passing. However, Shakyamuni answers the multitude of great Bodhisattvas saying, Desist, men of good faith. There is no need for you to uphold this scripture. In response, a great multitude of bodhisattvas of the earth, equal in number to the sands of 60,000 Ganges rivers, emerge from within the earth. The four bodhisattvas, Jogyo, Muhengyo, Jogyo, and Anryugyo, as the leaders, appear at the head of an assembly of countless bodhisattvas. It's so exciting, really, this story, isn't it? And this is, the, of course, the realization which Mr. Toda had when he was in prison. Those of you who have seen the film of the Human Revolution uh, will probably remember that dramatic scene in his cell when he suddenly comes to realize that he is one of the bodhisattvas of the earth who appears uh, in that chapter of the Lotus Sutra. And of course, it's difficult for us to appreciate that in those days there weren't these sort of guidances around. There was nothing in writing anywhere except the Lotus Sutra itself. And as you remember, uh, somehow the Lotus Sutra kept on coming up into his cell for him to read. And he didn't particularly want to read it, rather heavy going. And he kept on sending it back and saying he wanted another book. And always the Lotus Sutra came back again. So in the end, he decided he had to read it. And of course, it's very, very difficult to understand. Reading about the Bodhisattva of the Earth, one day, as he chanted, as you know, uh, I think it was 10,000 Daimoku every day with his Jews who made out of milk bottle tops and string. And uh, one day, this whole realization came to him. Indeed, you know, he must be a Bodhisattva of the Earth. Therefore, no matter what, he must survive in prison out, he must start to follow the exhortation of the Buddha in the Lotus Sutra to spread the Kosa Rufa, no matter what, in the latter day of the law. So this was where his whole inspiration and determination came, through that vivid experience one day of realizing that he himself, as it were, was at the ceremony in the air. The ceremony in the air is an allegory, but nevertheless, it represents uh, the, the, the rhythm and purpose of universal life, the purpose of humanity, the purpose of human beings, if you like, in this world and their mission. And this he began to totally understand. And so Zenzi here is talking, of course, about the difference between the times. Those bodhisattvas who stood up and said, we will do it in the latter day of the law, and then to their, to their shock, Shakyamuni Buddha said, no, not you. It's going to be all these, and these tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bodhisattvas rode out of the earth. To those disappointed bodhisattvas, they were representing the fact that there is a difference between times before the latter day of the law and after the latter day of the law, basically. So, uh, the difference is in terms of the development or life of this world itself, as I'm sure you've heard me say before. The world enters, or is going through a cycle of life like everything else in the universe. This planet is going through that cycle. It has already entered, according to Buddhist wisdom, its eons of decline. 
eons and eons and eons, of course, billions of years before it finally blows up and fuses back into the universe, but nevertheless it's entered that period. Therefore, as it gets older physically, it needs more life force. Right? It's common sense, isn't it? We also, as we get older, need life force. We can generate it. The amazing thing is through this practice. So I'm getting older physically, but still I can generate life force every day, which keeps me functioning, I hope, uh, in a way that still has some value. And probably I can go on functioning till the very moment of my death and still doing something valuable, even though it may get less and less in terms of energy and time. So the world is the same. When the world is getting older, it needs life force. That is why the true Buddha has to appear. The original Buddha has to appear at the beginning of the latter day of the law in order to teach human beings how to activate their life force and fulfill their purpose in life. Whereas previously, the bodhisattvas who held up their hands and Sakamuni said no to them, it's not your task in the latter day of the law, they had through a very slow process, there was no hurry. When the world is born, like all of us, like a little boy, we're full of life force in a natural way. So over eons and eons and eons of lifetimes, they made their causes gradually to climb the ladder towards the state of Buddha. And then finally, they were born with Shakyamuni Buddha, uh, or just after his lifetime, and they were able, some of them, and they were only limited in number, uh, because ordinary people, peasants and things, had no time to practice Buddhism. It was so time-consuming and involved and difficult. But there were people who obtained, attained Buddhahood in that way. So that's called the Buddhism of the harvest. They reaped the harvest of Buddhahood through their sincere efforts over many, 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 many lifetimes. Whereas uh, this Buddhism today is the Buddhism of the sowing seed of Buddhism uh, is planted and can blossom in one lifetime. It's necessary now. It's necessary that we can grasp nam myo Ejo and the Gons and do gong develop life force, feed the Shotin Zenjin, as I was talking about earlier, feed our environments. We know this is We have to. The year of peace in our communities is the first step you know, to make sure that we feed our communities with our life force and the actions that result from that life force. Okay.